and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing on CCTV News. I'm your host, Tian Wei. On today's program, U.S. President Barack Obama joins the CIA and the FBI in concluding that Russia did hack the Democrats to help Donald Trump's campaign, casting doubts on the U.S. presidential election. And Facebook clamps down on fake news in the nick of time or a little too late. Is Russia really hacking the U.S. election? The U.S. government now formally accuses Russia of hacking the Democratic Party's computer networks. The White House supports an investigation by Congress into the role Russia played, and the CIA asserts that emails hacked by Russia may have influenced the outcome. But Russia denies any involvement, dismissing the accusation as rubbish. In his final news conference of the year, President Obama echoed the conclusion of the U.S. intelligence community that Russia hacked computer networks belonging to the Democratic National Committee and Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. As Clinton and Donald Trump battled it out, Trump used the leaked emails as a political weapon. President Obama says at the time he wanted the public to know about the Russian hacking, but he didn't want to stir things up. What I was concerned about in particular was making sure that that wasn't compounded by potential hacking that could hamper vote counting, affect the actual election process itself. And so in early September when I saw President Putin in China, I felt that the most effective way to ensure that that didn't happen was to talk to him directly and tell him to cut it out and there were going to be some serious consequences if he didn't. Trump has dismissed the accusation of a Russian plot as ridiculous, saying they were just another excuse by supporters of Hillary Clinton, including the CIA. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says he was dumbstruck by the U.S. claims that Vladimir Putin may have been personally involved. You know, I was shocked when I saw this news on the television. I have nothing to add. I think that the stupidity and hopelessness of such an attempt to convince people of this is obvious. President Obama has told the intelligence community to conduct a thorough review of potential foreign interference in the elections and is encouraging Republicans and Democrats to work together on the issue. He's also warning Russia of unspecified retaliation, though his successor, who will be walking into the White House on January the 20th, may take a different view. Daniel Wrenches, Washington. Definitely taking a different view. For more on allegations that Russia did hack the U.S. to influence the election, we are joined in Beijing studio Yang Xiyu, senior fellow at the China Institute of International Studies. Joining us in Washington, Mr. Anton Fidashian, who is a professor of Russia history at the American University, originally coming from Russia, and also in D.C., Ivan Eland, a senior fellow and director of the Center on Peace and Liberty at the Independent Institute. Welcome to all of you, gentlemen. First of all, uh, Mr. Elan, help us briefly to understand the party division regarding this issue, whether Russia hacked the United States or not to influence the election result. Well, I'm not sure it's a strict party division. Many of senior Republicans, I think, do believe that the Russians uh, hacked the, the system and not only hacked it, but distributed uh, stuff to uh, try to in, uh, influence the election. Uh, the person who really doesn't believe it is Donald Trump and his uh, camp and his uh, uh, transition team. So I'm not sure it's a strict partisan uh, divide at this point. If it is not a straight partisan divide at this point, Mr. Eland, what does it mean for Republican Party? I mean, only 20 days before Mr. Trump uh, walking into the White House. Obviously, some of the major party members, well, such as uh, Mitch McDonnell, of course, the majority leader, and the senator from Arizona, which is a very well-known and respected the one, uh, all want to get investigation about Russia in that regard. Well, I think uh, what Trump needs to do is say, listen, uh, you know, the election is the election, and uh, I, I've won. 
And uh, certainly we can have a, an investigation about that. And I think that's probably what will happen. Mm. Uh, and I think the Republicans will push him to do that because there a lot of the Republicans are much more pessimistic about uh, U.S.-Russian relations than the Trump uh, uh, um, transition team is. So I think uh, they'll be pressured to do some sort of an investigation. And I think that's good because mm -hmm. we really need to find out what happened and whether the Russians, uh, you know, what the Russians were up to. And uh, I think it's pretty clear what they were up to, uh, but I think we need uh, a, a congressional investigation or an independent investigation to find okay. out, uh, you know, uh, what the extent of it. Well, Professor Fidashian, really? Uh, is that very clear what the Russians are up to as being said by Mr. Yiland? Um, no, I don't think it's uh, clear at all, and I agree with Ivan that there should be uh, an impartial investigation. Uh, the, the problem with all of this is that what we are discussing on this show right now has not been officially uh, endorsed by any of the U.S. Uh, intelligence agencies. The information was leaked to the press. Um, and so that's what's created uh, uh, all of the uh, conspiracy theories around this, because when you don't have enough information and you have no proof, that's exactly what, uh, what happens. Um, the, uh, the Hill has asked for briefings, uh, happened last week, and uh, the U.S. intelligence community uh, declined to do them. I presume it, they're still uh, gathering okay. evidence. Uh, and uh, most importantly, of course, is uh, that the, uh, the, the full review that President Obama ordered is only to be completed by his last day in office, raising the very interesting question of why his administration is, in a sense, kicking the can down the road to the Trump administration. Before we let uh, the other party to answer that question, Professor Fidashian, uh, is that really true? I mean, uh, that uh, the community of intelligence have not necessarily responded. It seems that this, both the CIA and the FBI have already made clear that they see eye to eye on this issue. And the conclusion apparently is Russia did get involved. Oh, uh, it, 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 listen, there have been a lot of leaks uh, coming out uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of reporting, but what hasn't happened is an official endorsement uh, 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 identifying uh, which Russian state actors have exactly been doing what. And that's why there is a review uh, going on the uh, evidence for this. Sure. This is uh, one of those postmodern uh, sort of stories where different parties say different things to different um, media outlets, but the whole story sure. is not cut and dry yet. Okay, uh, P uh, Professor Vidashian, I can ask you very briefly a question before I go to the others. That is, seem, judging from your last sentence, you're suggesting kicking the can down the road by President Obama, is that a reflection of his intention to make it uh, party politics? Is it a re Democrat's reaction to their failure in the presidential election or his opposition to the incoming president? Briefly from you. Um, quite possibly. The thing is that uh, I think the broader issue here is that uh, the U.S. doesn't have a clear-cut policy. No country has a clear-cut policy about how to react to such things as uh, hacks. All right. Mr. Young, you'll be listening to your yeah. counterparts, both of them in Washington with very different views. Yep. But the question is not necessarily for the others, mm -hmm. whether the election has been hacked by one party or not, to what extent, or whether that could be counted or not. But rather, what would this mean, really, for the U.S.-Russia relations? Obviously, President-elect Mr. Trump seems to have a very new blueprint in his mind about how Washington should work with Moscow. But apparently, not that easy, it seems. Yes, that question is the most, uh, most important one uh, from all the third parties. Now, Russia and the U.S. are disputing about yes or no. Mm. But for all of the rest, uh, are focusing on what will happen in the next phase of the Russian-U.S. relation. Uh, the, common knowledge, uh, the common knowledge is uh, the President-elect Trump will conduct a pro-Russian policy. Mm. However, such disputes will produce a very strong influential negative factor affecting what Trump want to, what wants to do, plus the opposition uh, to the pro-Russian policy in the United States. I think that will be very complicated uh, internal struggle about mm. Russian policy making.
That's the most important inference. Talking about people's attitude toward Russia, we took out some numbers for you. Well, never believe the numbers 100%, but sometimes they do could provide some reference. A majority of Americans believe that Mr. Trump is positive about Russia. Meanwhile, a recent poll found Republican voters view Putin much more favorably now than they did before the election. Back in July 2014, just 10% of Republicans held a favorable view of Putin, the Russian president, according to a poll conducted by The Economist and also YouGov. Uh, by September 2016, that number rose already to 24%. That's even higher uh, in December, 37%. Once again, we should not necessarily believe in polls 100%, but they do help us to understand certain trends. So, Mr. Eland, given what all of you have analyzed earlier, and these seem to be changing views about Russia and about President Putin mm -hmm. in the United States, how much do you think uh, President-elect Mr. Trump will be able to push forward his agenda on the new policy toward Russia? Well, I think he, he can he can probably do what he wants as as far as that goes, and he seems to be indicating that he wants to have a better relationship with Russia, and I'm not opposed to that. I think we should too. Uh, we can uh, work with them on Islamist terrorism. We can uh, work with them on uh, perhaps countering a rising China, et cetera. And uh, so, but I think uh, we really have to defend our uh, election system very rigorously and it is very curious that Obama is mm. having this report done at the end of his term rather than uh, uh, earlier so he could take some actions but it may just take uh, time to collect all the information and, and I would right. say confirm that the Russians have done this and uh, you know we're not in a court of law here uh, I think Obama could conceivably retaliate for this even before the report is in uh, All right. The standards of evidence uh, of intelligence are lower, and then have Trump can come in and uh, improve the relationship. But I think uh, something needs to be done uh, to defend our election system. The uh, Democratic Party, of course, has been talking about it also from the White House as well. They said uh, uh, President Obama already approached President Putin about the internet uh, interactions uh, between the two countries, if I could use that word. And of course, uh, they consider that already as a reaction coming from the White House. Whether further actions or sanctions need to be done, that of course is up to the current White House and the future White House. Having said that, though, we did hear from our Washington counterpart, Mr. Elan, China's name being mentioned, Mr. Yang. Mm -hmm. I know you have noticed that. Uh, yep. So, what does that mean? I mean, see this debate between Moscow and Washington about uh, you know interaction or not on the internet uh, affecting the result of the election, but eventually. Mm -hmm. The most important thing really is the bilateral relations. If the two get together, mm -hmm. is China going to be the loser? Well, I don't think so. Uh, many people are talking about or speculating about the triangle relation among the three, among the three especially if Donald Trump uh, conduct the pro-Russian uh, strategy, that will make uh, invisible uh, coordination relations against China. Mm -hmm. But uh, Russia is quite uh, independent. And the Russian is quite smart. He will make uh, their interests maximized by making good relations uh, with both of the powers. Mm -hmm. So that's an, if that's a triangle, that would be new type of triangle rather than the triangle in the Cold War era. I see. Interesting. You talk about the new triangle. Yep. We'll let uh, uh, Professor Fitashian to have a. a insight about that. What do you make of it at this moment? How difficult it is for Mr. Trump really to turn the relations with Russia to much degree, as much degree as possible? Well, he's certainly been very vocal about it. As a matter of fact, he was uh, the one thing that he was consistent about during the campaign uh, was improving the relationship with Russia. And it's interesting that that um, uh, leitmotif uh, was so damaging to him and so easy to exploit uh, for the Democrats that, in my opinion, it's uh, one of those things that he definitely believes. But mm -hmm. there is something important to, to consider here. Um, Washington, as every other capital in the world, has 
has institutional memory and it has an ingrained bureaucracy. And regardless of who Donald Trump brings into uh, the State Department, at this point it looks like uh, Rex Tillerson will, uh, will be taking over, uh, he will face an enormous amount of uh, opposition from people who have uh, been at the forefront of U.S. Mm -hmm. policy towards Russia over the past uh, eight years. So even uh, if Trump and Tillerson are very positively inclined towards Russia, this does not mean that uh, American policy will sort of effortlessly uh, shift uh, mm -hmm. in the favor of uh, Moscow. Uh, this will be a process, and we'll have to wait and see how it plays out. Well, at this moment, of course, even Tillerson himself, uh, the incoming uh, State Secretary of State, his confirmation has to be done by the Congress, and congressional members already talk about no investigation about Russia's throwing elections, then no confirmation of him. But that's another story. But let me go back to you, Mr. Right. Uh, Eland, about uh, ex exactly what U.S. and Russia could do. At this moment, uh, Syria, of course, is a big issue. We already see um, Russia, Moscow at this moment be playing a very central role in the negotiation with Turkey, negotiation with Iran. The three parties are having a discussion t together without any participation of the United States. The US, it seems to be a loser here. Is U.S. necessarily going to bring the relation closer uh, toward the Russia? Well, Russia already got a lot of cars in the hand, not necessarily have to buy the bite. Well, it's sort of like a dog chasing a fire engine. What do you do with it when you get it? I'm not sure, you know, influence. We always talk about influence of various countries. I don't think the United States is a loser here at all. I think we need to stay out of a lot of these things. We've uh, overthrown Saddam Hussein and got terrorism and chaos. We've overthrown Muammar Gaddafi and gotten terrorism and chaos. Mm -hmm. And I could never understand why Obama wanted to overthrow Assad and remove the last uh, vestige of stability from Syria. So I think the Russians have been correct. Uh, along the way here, and uh, the United States uh, really needs to uh, pick and choose where it gets involved. They can't police the world anymore. Well, really can't afford to do that. And, uh, and can you and afford? I'm not can you that, afford uh, not to do anything about Syria? That is the big question, though. Can you afford that, though? Whoever is the president? Sure. I think we've got to say, listen. People have to work out their differences, and the United States is making it worse by uh, bombing the country and, uh, and, and putting arms in there. And so I think, uh, and uh, certainly the Russians are making it worse by doing that as well, and the Turkey and everybody else. And I think uh, some restraint on the part of the U.S. was uh -huh. necessary here. And uh, I, don't think we I don't think the United States needs to solve every problem in the world. And as Professor Obama correctly said, Syria is not in the, vet in the vital interests of the U.S. Well, Professor Fedashian, our other party just said, uh, a quote coming from President Obama, but at the same time, we do see uh, President Obama and his administration get involved. So, what do you think? Syria going to be a big card for Russia against the United States, or the two can see eye to eye on this uh, when the new president comes into the office? Really, what can the two work together? Well, look, um, I think what happened in Moscow uh, two days ago during the meeting between the uh, foreign ministers of Russia, Turkey, and Iran is indicative of which way the Syria issue is going. And it looks like those three countries um, are trying to regionalize this question mm -hmm. and, in a sense, to marginalize the United States and not uh, involve it too closely, leaving the door open for the Trump administration to decide whether it wants to work with Turkey, Iran, and Russia in settling this conflict, or whether it would rather throw its lot in with the Gulf uh, monarchies and uh, sort of take the opposite side in, uh, in the conflict. Uh, it sounds like Trump is ready to consider the option of working with Russia and with the Turks right. um, on the issue of Syria. But I don't think the Russians are actually going to try to use Syria as a card against the United States. That's not their uh, ultimate goal in the Middle East. It's to bring stability to Syria by keeping Assad in power long All enough right. to then fulfill a gradual political transition of him out of power, but not we immediately. Will, we'll see what exactly the purpose of all parties are or rather different parties are. Having said that, Mr. Yang, tomorrow, mm -hmm. on Friday, President Putin, coming from Russia, is going to give his annual news conference. Yep. That, of course, is one of the biggest events for President Putin. 
mm -hmm. for the rest of the world to get to know what exactly he's thinking, or yep. at least he want people to think he is thinking. Yep. So uh, I'm sure the U.S. policy will be occupied quite a pages over there. Yep. What do you think might be the messages coming from Moscow, given well, what's happening right now? Well, I think uh, President Putin will send a positive signals uh, to the United States. Uh, on one hand, on the other hand, he will send a signal to show Russia will uh, increase their involvement, even strengthen their dominance in the course of the Syria solution, and also make this uh, 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 achievements spill lower to this region. So in general, the geopolitical structure there is in reshaping, uh, started from Syria resolution course. Mm -hmm. Well, Ms. Uh, Professor Yadashian, what do you think? I'm sure Washington going to listen very closely. Well, absolutely. Um, it's difficult to predict uh, uh, what Putin is going to say. He's always full of surprises. But what is uh, certain is that he will make uh, sort of programmatic statements that will be directed at Washington and mm -hmm. specifically towards the Trump administration in order to give them bearings as to Russian expectations uh, after January the 20th. So it's impossible to predict exactly what he's going to say, uh, but I think that most of the world will be uh, listening tomorrow. Right. And uh, Mr. Elan, before we go briefly from you as well, what do you think coming out of that press conference to be on Friday? What could be the best message for Mr. Trump at this moment? What could be the worst message for Mr. Trump at this moment? Well, I think Putin will probably uh, encourage Trump to cooperate with them, but of course, uh, Turkey, Russia, and Iran. However, you know, we can settle this among regional powers or big powers or whatever, but the people on the ground do have a vote, and I think as long as they're getting uh, weapons and uh, uh, support from the Gulf Arab states, they're go there's going to be war. And we've mm -hmm. had countless, uh, we've had countless counterinsurgencies, which I explore in my book, The Failure of Counterinsurgency, where a, a great power thought it had won and it ended up losing the war. Uh, the Vietnam War is the All Tet right. Offensive was beaten back by the U.S. and the U.S. lost the war. Algiers, Battle of Algiers, the French won it. They lost the war. So this war is not over, and Russia could yet experience a quagmire because there's always okay. escalation pressures. If things don't go your way, let's put in more resources. Well, it seems that Mr. Eland is shying from uh, providing Mr. Trump with the best messages. But for now, <laughs> I do want to thank uh, all of you gentlemen for your insights on this issue. Ivan Eland, Anton Vidashian, and Yang Xi. Thank you so much, the three of you, for being with us. Really appreciate it. You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on our program. No longer prone to be a web of lies, the world's biggest social network gets tougher on hoax stories on this site, at least in Germany. Welcome back. You're watching World Insight, coming to you Monday to Friday on CCTV News. Facebook says it will introduce tools to prevent fake news stories from spreading on its social media platform. The move comes in response to rising criticism that the social network failed to do enough to combat the problem during the run-up to the U.S. presidential election. Will the action really work? The social network is finally taking misinformation seriously. Facebook has outlined details of its several projects to clamp down on fake news on the site. The seven plans include improving technical ability to classify misinformation, making it much easier for people to report fake stories, using fact-checking organizations to help debunk articles, labeling stories that have been flagged as false, disrupting the economics of fake news, and working with the news industry. Facebook's move comes in response to the outcry over the persistence of hoax stories during the 2016 U.S. presidential election campaign. Though Facebook chairman Mark Zuckerberg previously responded to critics by saying over 99% of the site's content was authentic, Allegations of social media impacting the recent election pushed the tech giant to do more. The credibility of the platform is critical for tech companies, which rely on user growth and engagement. However, as Mr. Zuckerberg posts, how to strike a balance between acting as an information gatekeeper and giving people a voice is definitely a huge challenge for a social media platform. How users would respond to these actions is an open question.
The fine line between freedom of speech and reporting only the facts is hard to pin down, both technically and philosophically. For more discussion on Facebook's new tools to stop the spread of fake news and also the latest news that Germany is punishing fake news on social media platforms, we are joined here in Beijing by Mr. Jay Huang, who is the founder of uh, Jade Stone Venture and former managing director of Intel China. In Washington, D.C., uh, Christopher Chambers, professor of journalism at Georgetown University. Also in Washington, we are joined by Dr. Ernest McDuffie, a computer scientist and founder of Global McDuffie Group. Welcome to the three of you. It is not the first time, gentlemen, to have the three of you together to discuss issues about fake news on social media platform. We got some new news coming in at this moment. Uh, Mr. Chambers, you understand in Germany there has been new rules coming out saying social media platforms, as long as they put over there more than 24 hours fake news, it's likely to be punished with half a million U.S. dollars. Well, you have to understand that uh, the U.S. is the only country that has something like the First Amendment, which um, oh. prohibits or strictly regulates government action in that regard. So that doesn't surprise me that Germany would come up with this because a lot of uh, very fine censorship tools come from emergency situations. The, 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 the intent is always good, but uh -huh. the effect might be bad. Well, Jay, what do you think? Is it really likely to work, first of all? Well, uh, it's really difficult to tell and at this stage whether it's going to work or not. Why not? I think, uh, you know, we get so many information on the platforms and how can they, uh, you know, judge and, uh, you know, within 24 hours, which is fake, which is not. And also on the Internet, as we know, it's a global. And uh, I don't know, uh, you know, how they apply this rule only to uh, German language or it's an, uh, you know, any information on the Facebook's platform. That could be huge. Let's go to these points. First of all, can they do it? like what the Chinese idioms say, kill the kitchen to alert the monkey, uh, at least to do one or two cases to one or, of, or two of those who create fake news and therefore make the others realize they can't do that anymore. Secondly, about the global, uh, can they at least policing that, the fake news, in Germany or within one national border? I think that they may be uh, make that effect, as you said, uh, you know, scare them <laughs> and let's say to take some action. Uh -huh. That that part may work, but in the end, it's, I just cannot see uh, it is feasible to control so many information on the internet by mm -hmm. by imposing a fine to the uh, platform company. Uh, Ernest has been uh, listening very seriously to the other two counterparts. I almost know your stance because you're always with the Internet community. So tell us what you think, sir. Well, w the first thing that comes to mind is that uh, Facebook is not a news uh, organization. Oh, right? that's there debatable, isn't it? Diverse well, I mean, I as far as its intended purpose, you know, people people use Facebook in that way, but Facebook didn't start out to be the purveyor of uh, news as a CNN did or uh, or any other of the uh, mainstream uh, news organizations. So, a lot of information gets uh, propagated across the platform mm -hmm. for all kinds of reasons, and so I I, I would agree with the uh, the other uh, speakers that it's going to be very difficult uh, to police uh, something like that. Uh, globally, you know, it's just uh, too much information, too many different platforms. Well, the fundamental issue uh, for for me has to become with the user themselves. People have to uh, take responsibility uh, for understanding uh, what they're reading, where it's coming from, what the sources are, being okay. able to apply critical thinking. Well, Christopher, it's not the first time that we heard Ernest talk about that, right? Now, if I remember right. So what about your response to it? Uh, to let the individual be the police, quote unquote, about uh, fake news or not? Can they really judge? Well, I, I agree. <clears throat> I agree. Um, in theory, the problem is in practice, you have an ironic situation where social media platforms have created a mindset of uh, tribalism uh, in various countries and, and, and the United States. I mean, you get to pick your own echo chamber. You get to pick your own tribe. You get to pick your own bubble mm. to live in. 
So in, in theory, I think, you know, what, what Mr. McDuffie said is very important, and, and, and it, is, it does rest with the end user, it does rest with the individual, no matter what their age or their partisan alignment. However, the situation we're stuck with now is that Facebook has become a news organization and is even farming out this, this uh, kind of fact-checking to uh, organizations like um, PolitiFact that serve other news organizations. Right. So we have, we have a little ironic horizontal integration across platforms here because the individuals are, cre you know, we're human beings and we're, and we're tribal creatures and we're going to create our own tribes. And that has not worked out well in American politics in the last 10 years. Talking about American politics, we do want to see some numbers. Facebook was widely criticized this time after users complained that fake news had influenced the U.S. presidential election. Whether that's true or not, to what degree, we don't know. A BuzzFeed post-election analysis found that fake news stories significantly rather outperformed the real news stories in the final three months leading to the U.S. presidential election. The top 20 best performing false election stories from hoax sites and hyperpartisan blogs generated about 8.7 million shares, likes and reactions compared to just the 7.3 million from reputable news sources. And while both liberals and conservatives shared fake news, Trump supporters, it seems, were particularly susceptible to it. 38% of fake news shared came from conservative sites compared to just 20% from liberal sites. But of course, all of these numbers we have is coming from uh, surveys and analysis. Uh, we can never assume it is 100% correct, and yet, once again, it could provide some reference for our analysis. So Jay, having heard that, you are still insisting on what you earlier have just said? Uh, yes, but <laughs> I, I, actually, you, you look at the numbers, just take the number as a face value, mm -hmm. right? One could argue to say traditional media are quite biased and in supporting an, a liberal view, supporting an, a Clinton. Well, on the, on the other, uh, like more conservative, uh, rely on the social media for their uh, information sharing. If you combine them together, one could argue and actually they're balanced. Regardless if it's balanced or not, my view is... Uh, I'm not sure whether people would really uh, agree with your assumption that traditional media are all liberal. Well, social media is more pro-Trump, but certainly what we talk about is fake news. That has been pro-Trump, 38% compared to 20%. But having said that, go ahead with your point. Uh, I agree with you, but, but I still um, believe it's up to the readers and okay. then to realize actually what they read on the, on the Facebook, for example, uh, could be and uh, you know the fake news. You heard Christopher just talk about that ideal situation. Yes, rely on the readers, but he said also, in reality, the people live in their bubbles. Even Facebook itself, which claims themselves to be a, a platform, not a news organization, has already uh, hired uh, fact-checking groups based on the international fact-checking code of principles to do fact-checking on its own site. So what would you say? Well, uh, then it's up to the uh, you know, <laughs> fact checker, whether they are biased or not biased, wow. that's one thing, right? And another thing is, I think that ultimately, I believe the readers should have uh, built their own immune system. As we all know, as human beings, the immune system can only be built by an, an exposure to a viruses and, and a bacteria. Yeah. more uh, chaotic presidential elections ahead, is that what you mean? Yeah, or? that's how they, they learn well, and then, uh, you know, how to build the immune system, that, at least that's my view. Okay, Jay is talking about that in China, but, but Ernest, can you really uh, afford another or more uh, chaotic uh, presidential elections? What do you think about the latest movement by uh, Facebook? Yeah, I, I think it's a move in the right direction. I mean, we're, we're, first, we're faced with certain realities um, that, that these platforms are going to be with us, that the tribal nature of society is going to be with us. I think the important thing to, to try to get to is that people can, can disagree about uh, spin and biases, but what we can't disagree about is objective facts. There has to be some platform or some uh, medium uh, mm -hmm. that is, focuses purely on identifying things that are factual versus things that are not factual on a mm -hmm. scientific uh, basis. So I, I would like to see uh, an application 
of um, some tool, uh, non, you know, some artificial intelligence tool like uh, an IBM Watson that evaluated in real time <laughs> thousands of articles and inputs and, you know, determined oh, the okay. factual nature of it. But even, <laughs> even if you did that, there would still be people in the bubble that would say, well, I don't believe that, <laughs> uh, that artificial tool was created by some human and they were biased. So <laughs> you're always going to have that problem. So yeah. again, it kind of goes back to the individual having their proper education and training in terms of critical thinking so that they can, if they wish to, you know, instead of just living in their bubble, actually evaluate things on their own. You know, Christopher, Ernest just talked like a tech guy. He proposed a technical solution. <laughs> Let's just use artificial intelligence. And then he's also said, well, in reality, maybe technology is not going to solve that problem. But having said that, Christopher, <laughs> let, me, let me ask you. Um, so what is next? Because we are in the internet age. We have to accept this fact, and the reality is, Whoever is writing without the real name being signed can write whatever he or she wants without any credibility. Well, yes. And at this moment, with the globalized yes, internet, it's very hard to trace eventually to exactly who wrote what. So, under these circumstances, what can we do, Christopher? Well, there are some cir circumstances where people have been able to trace fake news sources, say, to uh, even some teenagers in Macedonia uh, pumping out That's right. uh, thousands of, of, of blog stories. Um, you have a situation now where you have uh, applications and technology that can create uh, fake video and audio mm -hmm. clips. Um, so it's, it's beyond uh, uh, news sites. It's, it's you can create your own uh, video. You can, we have celebrities where you can show them smiling uh, when they've been taking a picture and, and they're not smiling, mm -hmm. so the computer can make them smile. So I, I really don't know. Um, what we can do, however, with, with certain platforms like Facebook, I think f social media platforms are going to have to start partnering um, with traditional media sources because there you don't need AI to, 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 to manage stories. You have people called editors and reporters right. who've been doing it for 200 years right. and, and have the expertise to do it. So I think maybe we'll see an ironic situation where Facebook and other p advanced platforms are going to have to partner with legacy old school organizations to, to maybe take some of that, that skill set from some of these individuals you know, and, and use them um, whether they like it or not. They're going to have to start using people with that training. Obviously, Christopher, you're coming from another camp, the real journalism camp, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> proposing a cooperation with the new tech companies. Yes. But will that likely to happen? I mean, uh, Jay, once again, let's face the reality. Fake news sales because dramatic because people want to know the so-called stories, juicy stories. Yeah. And yet the facts, scientific stories, do not necessarily sell. Yeah. People respect serious journalism, but you know, once they get home, they don't really want to read yeah. that serious the journalism stories. So uh, is Christopher's solution likely to work? I think for a platform company like a Facebook, and uh, they need to, you know, strike a balance between freedom of speech and also the make sure and less and or no fake news uh, on their platform. That's you you see, you are going against your original point at this moment. No, Jay. no, no, no. Okay, Get, uh, explain. This please. is a balance. <laughs> <laughs> I think the fact checker is right. It's right, but I need, we need to get a balance. But ultimately, I still believe it's up to the readers, and then to build their own immune system, mm -hmm. and then th they have to realize all they read and on the on the Facebook or any social media cannot be uh, trusted 100 percent. They need to find and you know you know which side and which information are correct. Mm. So that's what I call immune system. But do you think, uh, Ernest, what the Germans are trying to do at this point can be an interesting experiment in terms of trying to get rid of a fake news to the extent that we can yeah. at this point when we do not have yeah. better solutions? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, uh, the pressure, of the financial pressure, the threat of uh, th financial um, penalties for propagating these fake news stories will at least uh, force companies to consider 
uh, what their options are in mm. dealing with those uh, issues going forward. So, I, you know, I'm a big proponent of the First Amendment and free speech, and it's often been said that the antidote for uh, bad speech is more uh, good speech. So, you, mm. you know, the censorship is not the, uh, not the solution, but these financial incentives to, to do the right thing, okay. you know, I think has a, certainly has a role to play. All right. Finally, before we go, also thoughts from the both of you, uh, Christopher and also Jay, very briefly, one sentence if you can. Christopher. Um, I think there has to be more vigilance. I think the responsibility does fall on end users, but I think that uh, social media platforms are going to have to partner more vigorously with traditional news platforms mm -hmm. that have the experience to... to to sort out what's 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 fair what and what isn't what's factual and what isn't all right jay i think it's a new challenge and for everyone and then uh, you know for readers and also for platform company we all have to come up to a solution and then in this new and internet uh, era okay i hope it's not going to be a forever challenge that's the least i can say at this moment uh, for now i want to thank the three of you for being with us uh, ernest mcduffie christopher chambers and jay huang really appreciate gentlemen for you are very different perspective. Thank you so much. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, you can visit our website. Just type World Inside CCTV News into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching and tune in again tomorrow for more insights from across China and around the world. Good night.